Good afternoon, everyone. We are giving just a few more moments uh, for folks to log on before we begin. Muting all of these phones. Good call. It'll be interesting to see if my dog decides to, you know, trip through it and point in the meeting. No more ice cream noises in the background. Yeah, no worries. Actually, it's probably a good time to mention that we should all probably mute. Um, and I'll, I'll actually get going. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the National Conference of State Legislatures, second of a three-part uh, meeting series on policing policy, uh, hosted by the Law, Criminal Justice, and Public Safety Committee. My name is Lucia Bragg, Senior Policy Specialist staffing the committee and I will be your moderator today. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to go over a few logistics of this briefing. So for now, everyone is on mute. I encourage you to uh, ask questions as we go using the chat box, uh, which is either on the right of your screen or accessible by clicking the word bubble uh, symbol in the navigation bar at the bottom of your screen. So NCSL staff on the line will collect questions for Q&A uh, and our presenters will respond at the end of, uh, end of the full presentation. So we have two speakers. They'll respond to your questions at the very end of both those presentations. Uh, this meeting will be recorded and posted on NCSL's YouTube page for future reference. Uh, and once our speakers uh, begin, NCSL staff will periodically you know, enter related resource links uh, into the chat box for your reference. Um, so without further delay, I will pivot to today's program. Uh, the nation has witnessed a powerful series of protests across the country in recent weeks uh, in response to the death of George Floyd while in Minneapolis police custody. These recent protests have generated federal and state interest in examining and revising police practices. This series is meant to educate and inform state legislators and legislative staff across the country um, who work on policing issues in their states. So today we will discuss uh, congressional policing reform legislation uh, in the wake of those protests. Specifically, we're gonna talk about the Justice Act uh, in the Senate and the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act uh, in the House. So our speakers today are uh, Keenan Keller and Emily Lavery. Emily uh, currently serves as Senator Tim Scott's legislative assistant uh, for his work on issues under the Senate Judiciary Committee's uh, purview. So in her role, Emily advises uh, Senator Scott on criminal justice reform and policing reform, in addition to immigration, judicial nominations, uh, and other issues under the committee's jurisdiction. Emily served as Senator Scott's advisor during the drafting, debate, and final passage of the First Step Act uh, the Justice for Victims of Lynching Act, as well as uh, the drafting and introduction of Senator Scott's Justice Act, which we'll be talking about today. 
Uh, this year marks her fifth year serving uh, for the Senator. Our second speaker will be Keenan Keller. Keenan is Senior Democratic Counsel for the House uh, Judiciary Committee. In this capacity, uh, he drafts and analyzes legislation on a range of issues, including civil rights, criminal law, constitutional law, and uh, immigration for both the subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, uh, and Civil Liberties, and the full Judiciary Committee. So currently, Keenan serves as uh, primary counsel for the drafting and managing uh, passage of the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which we will be talking about today. Um, so, you know, it's worth mentioning that for more than two decades, uh, Keenan has worked with the committee uh, to develop bipartisan solutions to a range of challenging, you know, social and legal issues. Uh, and, you know, major legislative initiatives have included, you know, the Voting Rights uh, Advancement Act, a Second Chance Act, Hate Crimes Prevention Act, Unsolved Civil Rights Crime Act, uh, the End Racial Profiling Act, and others. So, uh, Keenan, we're going to start with you, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? Okay, a good nod. Uh, well, the tragic uh, death of George Floyd has awakened the nation and the world to the gross injustices that too many African Americans face on a daily basis at the hands of their local police. It's not a new story, but it's the sad truth uh, that when people tell their stories of uh, police abuse in the past, they simply weren't believed. And it's taken technology, these iPhone videos, uh, and the active involvement of citizens to document and expose the reality that exists in their communities. Uh, at this point, it's important that we not let this moment pass us by. Um, in the time that I've been on the committee, um, we've seen far, far, far too many of these incidents. We've seen uh, you know, an uptick of interest at the congressional level, but uh, never until uh, the death of George Floyd, when the public had to confront the eight minutes and 46 seconds of video and watching him die, um, have we had the kind of activity that we um, see today out on the streets? Uh, it's important for all of you to know that this is not a, a short time effort. This is not a passing fancy of members of the House and specifically of the Congressional Black Caucus. Um, John Kinders, who I originally worked for when I started on the committee, um, was the architect of the pattern and practice enforcement provision in the 1994 crime bill. He was also the author of the Traffic Stop Statistics Study Act, which was the first data collection uh, bill to make its way uh, to the House floor and pass under suspension. Um, he worked with President uh, George W. Bush and Attorney General John Ashcroft to craft the Interracial Profiling Act and worked with us on the development of the Law Enforcement Trust and Integrity Act. Um, we've been working on these issues for 20 years or more, and in the case of Mr. Conyers, um, he worked on legislation around uh, policing practices at the very start of his career. Um, it's important for us to note that this legislation does not come from a place of hostility to the police. Uh, we have been working with uh, police executive organizations. We've been working with patrol officers organizations for well more than a decade to craft much of this bill. Um, and so when the moment arose, um, we were able to act uh, quickly to put this legislation forward um, in the House. Uh, the bills have been seen by, again, executive and patrol officers organizations. They are very familiar with what's uh, in the bill um, and so they were able to react quickly to that. It, the important thing to remember about the legislation is that it is designed to support officers uh, in that it creates the first ever national accreditation standards for the operation of police departments. It sets national standards for the conduct of officers and establishes best practices in training, hiring, de-escalation strategies, and bystander duties. Um, but it's also equally important to note that despite you know, our best intentions, despite the best intentions of all police officers, 
there are going to be some officers who cross the line. And that's why the bill also includes strong accountability measures in the back end. Uh, and this is as a matter of simple justice that it's important for us to keep unfit officers off the streets. Um, in a profession where you have the power to kill, uh, it should also have uh, highly trained officers who are accountable to the public. And we think that the bill uh, accomplishes this. I wanna walk through some of these provisions. I know that I handed out uh, a fact sheet about the bill and a comparison between uh, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, the Justice Act, and uh, the President's executive order. But the, again, I'll make a quick trip through this. The first thing that we actually do is amend um, 18 U.S.C. 242 uh, to establish a uh, crime uh, around uh, chokeholds and uh, reckless activities uh, you know, by the police. We strike the death penalty from the statute so the death penalty is not an issue. Um, and we define resulting in death as being a substantial factor contributing to uh, the death of an individual. We roll back qualified immunity uh, with respect to law enforcement officers. Uh, we expand pattern and practice authority at the federal level and at the state level. Uh, we provide grants to assist uh, state attorneys general in bringing pattern and practice investigations. And we also uh, condition burn, jag, and cops grants on the elimination of any contractual practice uh, in collective bargaining that would prevent the attorney general from seeking or enforcing equitable or declaratory relief uh, against uh, law enforcement agencies engaging in patterns or practices of constitutional rights. We have a, a provision that addresses independent investigations uh, where we create, uh, again, grant authority to help uh, states and localities uh, create their own uh, independent uh, investigative uh, procedures. We have the Law Enforcement Trust and Integrity Act provision, which I mentioned earlier, which creates national standards and requires accreditation uh, for eligibility for discretionary grants uh, for police departments. It's very important to note that both the President's executive order and uh, the George Floyd House bill contain this provision. Um, the reason why that this is so important is that there are a, a host of operating um, standards that should be modernized in many police departments. And uh, those best practices can actually be developed and actually pushed through to local law enforcement agencies through independent uh, uh, accreditation provisions. Uh, we also have uh, transparency in data. Um, we have a broad range of data collection requirements here um, that would allow data collection on the use of force um, and racial profiling across the board. Um, it's very important to note that these kinds of data collection uh, provisions are supported by uh, policing organizations, especially executive organizations. Um, most departments collect data um, as uh, a high-level management practice. Um, and it's important for us to note that this is actually something that should be done um, across departments. Um, the thing to remember from our history about all of this is that there are many departments out there um, which uh, are not uh, operating with best practices in place. They don't collect management data, and then uh, when something happens, uh, it is a surprise to um, executives. It's a surprise to legislators because they weren't able to track uh, efficiently or to any real degree what was actually going on within their uh, police departments. It's also important to note that this data collection program that we have in the bill has been partially adopted in uh, Senator Scott's bill. Uh, we again have uh, a prohibition on racial profiling, uh, which goes back to President uh, Bush's first State of the Union address when he asked that we develop um, anti-profiling legislation with the Department of Justice that he was prepared to sign in late 2001. Unfortunately, 9-11 was a tragic intervening event and that moved us off the focus of, on the elimination of racial profiling, uh, but it has remained uh, a priority within uh, the CBC and within many uh, members of the House and the Senate. And the, the bill 
uh, puts those um, anti-profiling uh, provisions in place and requires data collection. Uh, we create a best practice duty to intervene. Um, the bill bans uh, no-knock warrants. The bill bans choke holes and carotid holds. Um, it establishes um, use of force as, use of deadly force as an absolute uh, last uh, ditch option um, under federal law and requires that states, again, through the conditioning of grants, adopt sim similar um, you know, uh, last alternative you know, deadly force requirements. Um, there are limitations to the 1033 program, uh, which would limit the transfer of military grade equipment to state and local law enforcement agencies. Um, and we, interestingly, I, I think to, to many folks, um, create uh, public safety innovation grants as part of the legislation which would allow communities to engage in the effort of rethinking uh, what public safety would involve um, in their uh, communities while working with law enforcement agencies. Um, we also um, have a sweep through uh, body cam uh, legislation. Uh, we require body cams uh, of uniformed federal officers and there's a body cam program that allows departments you know, which have not yet uh, been able to afford to uh, purchase body cams or need financial assistment, assistance to maintain their body cam programs to obtain grants from federal government uh, for those purposes. Um, we close the Law Enforcement Consent Loophole Act, uh, which makes it unlawful for a federal law enforcement officer to engage in a sexual act while under color of law or with an individual who is under arrest or in detention or in custody. Um, and um, I think the, the thing to remember here uh, as we have this conversation moving forward is there are a series of, I think, base principles that are guiding uh, what uh, we're trying to accomplish um, in the house. Um, the effort really started around uh, a letter that came from the leadership uh, conference on civil and human rights. Uh, and it was signed by more than uh, 400 groups. Um, and they had eight basic priorities. Uh, one was the creation of a use of force standard that allows force uh, only when, use deadly force when necessary in a last result. They were looking for a ban of chokeholds. They were looking for a ban on racial profiling. They wanted to establish a national police misconduct registry. Uh, they wanted the inclusion of recklessness as a standard of 18 U.S.C. 242. Uh, they wanted a prohibition on no-knock warrants in drug cases. They wanted the elimination of qualified immunity, um, and they wanted the demilitarization of law enforcement agencies. Um, when we approached this legislation, we took um, those eight asks from the civil rights advocacy community as being a baseline from which to operate in pulling together this bill. And um, we've actually, uh, approach those questions with real fidelity. And we have addressed all of that uh, in the context of drafting this bill. Uh, but we've also uh, gone beyond what they were looking for and putting in um, systemic uh, you know, remedies to address policing issues and really making an attempt at um, raising the overall standards of the profession. I'll stop there because I've you know, given you a lot of information and I'm sure that there are a lot of questions uh, flowing out of this. But um, we believe that uh, what we've done with the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act is to make uh, an effort that responds to the moment. Um, we've involved um, law enforcement. We have long-term involvement with uh, you know, our House Republicans and presidential administrations uh, to make this, I think, a historic bipartisan effort. Um, and we hope uh, that the stars will align and that the legislation can make it through to the president's desk. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Keenan. That was a, a really helpful overview. Um, thank you so much uh, for that look. And then we're going to pivot now. So that's kind of the House side uh, bill, and we're going to we're going to pivot now to the Senate side. Um, so uh, we're going to have Emily Lavery with Senator Tim Scott's office uh, give her presentation now. 
Emily, awesome. the floor is yours. Great. Um, thank you. And again, thank you guys so much for having me on. Um, happy to include some links to our bill. Again, this is all available on Senator Scott's website underneath of his press heading. So if you want to go there to just get some more materials, a section by section fact sheet, um, exact text of the bill, it's all available there. So I definitely encourage folks that are wanting to get, you know, some more materials to definitely stop there first. Um, but generally speaking, you know, Senator Scott's goal in this process is to make sure every American has faith in our justice system from beginning to end. Senator Scott began working on this issue in the Senate roughly five years ago after the tragic and untimely death of Walter Scott, which of course happened in Senator Scott's hometown. Um, and again, you know, Senator Scott's been extremely vocal about his own experiences with the criminal justice system, having been stopped by Capitol Police numerous times, having been stopped while driving um, numerous times, even recently stopped for not signaling early enough that he was changing lanes, which, you know, we didn't know was a thing, but apparently it is. And what again, uniquely positioned Senator Scott to really, um, you know, be extremely active and pivotal in this space is again, those experiences that he's had. And again, this was a large motivation in terms of him going to the leader and asking to be the lead on this issue. Um, so again, you know, upon the death of Walter Scott, that was when Senator Scott first began introducing bills in the space. So that's when he first introduced the Walter Scott Notification Act, which further increases accountability and transparency in law enforcement by, re by requiring use of force reporting. After that, he introduced legislation to provide additional body cameras to more officers. And again, you know, I think um, a very key phrase that I'm sure some of you have, have heard him use is that, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is worth a thousand pictures, right? Because it tells a very true um, and I think awakening you know, version of events that serves only to benefit um, those that are engaging with law enforcement, both the officers and civilians and building, of course, accountability and transparency in the process, which is so critical. Um, and so, of course, you know, we recently saw the passage of the First Step Act, which Senator Scott was extremely involved in. And now, of course, the Justice Act is the next part of this effort in terms of putting this country on a path towards progress. The reality is far too many people of color have lost faith in law enforcement. And tragedies like George Floyd's death or Breonna Taylor's death only add to the breakdown of the relationships between law enforcement and the communities they serve, in particular communities of color. While we know that the vast majority of our law enforcement officers are good, honest people, we also want to do our best to make sure that they all are, and that people of color don't have to look over their shoulders any longer. Um, so in terms of the Justice Act and, and its specific provisions, it covers a lot. Um, there's a lot of overlap with the House. There's a lot of differences with the House, and I'll get into those as well. Um, but in short, the Justice Act, namely, includes a litany of law enforcement reforms, including use of force reporting, no-knock warrant reporting, incentivizing chokehold bans, increasing penalties for false police reports, obviously includes an extremely robust grant program to get more body-worn cameras on the streets. Um, you know, we included law enforcement records retention, which would allow for sharing of disciplinary records so that we can ensure that an officer who is maybe a bad actor in one county can't simply go three counties over um, and get a job that they maybe should not have. Of course, we include the Justice for Victims of Lynching Act, which is my boss's bill that has passed the Senate twice. We also include the Rubio Bill, which is the Commission on the Social Status of, Blen and, of Black Men and Boys Act, um, which will issue a wide ranging report on conditions affecting Black men and boys, including education, healthcare, financial status, and within the criminal justice system. Um, of course, we also include provisions on de-escalation and duty to intervene training, which is mandated, um, as well as the National Criminal Justice Commission Act, which will undertake a comprehensive review of our criminal justice system and recommend best practices not only in policing tactics, but also in hiring practices, administration, um, boosting community transparency. Um, and outside of that, of course, you know, we also included our law enforcement agency hiring and training provision, which is grant eligibility for recruiters and academy candidates. And this is again, to ensure that our law enforcement departments look more like the communities that they are trying to police. Um, so again, I've mentioned a little bit about the best practices pieces as well. And then we also include reauthorization of Fern Jag and COPS, 
um, as well as the closing the Law Enforcement Consent Loophole Act, which makes it unlawful for a law enforcement officer to engage in a sex act while acting under color of law with an individual who is under arrest. Um, we also include five bipartisan measures, which of course is the closing the Law Enforcement Consent Loophole Act, the National Criminal Justice Commission Act, the Justice for Victims of Lynching Act, the Commission on the Social Status of Black Men and Boys Act, as well as the reauthorization of the COPS program. So again, you have a lot of bipartisan measures that were really baked into the bill, um, you know, before it was, it was even brought to the floor. Um, and Senator Scott very much so did that intentionally, right? And again, you know, we were very much so aware of the provisions the House had put, put out, um, you know, their stated goals and really made a, a concerted effort to again, home in on the issues we're trying to address. Um, so again, I know I've thrown a lot out there, but in terms of the three main goals, we chiefly focused on improving and reforming policing practices, bolstering accountability in law enforcement and increasing transparency in the criminal justice system. Um, so kind of within that first bucket, right? The Justice Act immediately puts an end to the use of chokeholds. It enlists DOJ to develop and implement training on de-escalation, responding to mental health crises and fulfillment of duty to intervene policies. Also promotes, again, diverse hiring, which we've already kind of covered, puts more body-worn cameras on the streets. Um, we also require the director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture to develop and nationally disseminate a curriculum to educate participants on the history of racism in the United States. And again, this is a really critical part of the bill is addressing issues of racism through education and not just turning a blind eye to the experiences of different people within this country, um, as well as the historic and, and um, you know, systematic disparities that continue to persist in the outcomes as it relates to law enforcement. Um, so again, we also fostered the development of best practices for hiring, firing, and discipline of law enforcement officers, which we know can be very tricky from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, as well as, you know, in terms of the second bucket of bolstering accountability, we of course require departments to maintain appropriately share and review disciplinary records before an officer is hired. Um, so we wanted to ensure that we're focusing on not only increasing penalties for things like false police reports, which Breonna Taylor's case very much so highlights, um, as well as penalties for officers that abuse body worn camera policies but also making sure that we're weeding out bad actors before they ever get into the door, right? Um, and so again, in terms of the third bucket, you know, we also um, put a, a pretty hefty emphasis on focusing on requiring use of force reporting, no knock warrant reporting, both of which are made public, um, as well as public lists of um, which departments have certified that their officers are adequately trained on de-escalation, responding to mental health crises and the duty to intervene, which is not too dissimilar from what the White House put out as well. Um, and then of course we have a couple commissions looking at comprehensive reviews of a number of issues. Um, so again, you know, when we're starting to talk about kind of where do we both overlap and where do we differ? Um, that's not to say that, you know, there aren't key areas of discrepancies. Obviously there are, or I don't think we would be in this current situation, right? Um, where the process appears very much so stalled out. Um, but that's not to say that there is absolutely no overlap in this process, right? Both ban unnecessary and deadly practices like chokeholds. Both require more and better training and practices for law enforcement in key areas like de-escalation, duty to intervene, et cetera. Both support the expanded use of body-worn cameras. Both support information sharing to ensure bad candidates are weeded out before they're hired. Both promote better hiring practices and securing more diverse hires. Both provide for education for law enforcement on racial disparities and systemic disenfranch disenfranchisement of people of color. Both focus on rooting out racial disparities. Both focus on boosting community transparency and relationships between law enforcement and the neighborhoods they're serving. And again, both focus on public reporting on the use of force to promote transparency. Both make publicly available information about how law enforcement agencies are being run and both investigate and recommend ways that we can shore up resources at the federal level outside of law enforcement to improve outcomes. And of course, both make lynching a federal crime for the first time in US history, which is a bill that should be passed right now, um, you know, if we could, if we could get it through. Um, so again, that's not to say that there aren't major differences between the bills, right? And that's also not to say that Senator Scott has turned a blind eye by any definition to those issues. I mean, he was quite vocal about having offered um, roughly 20 amendments 
um, in order to perfect the bill. Um, he's obviously been engaging directly um, with key Democrats who you know, are leaders on these issues and leaders in this process. Um, and so again, you know, while there are definitely key areas that need to be worked out and areas that our bill covers that the House bill doesn't cover, and we have different ways, of course, through you know, the mechanics, definitions, penalties, applications in many areas, um, you know, again, Senator Scott remains really hopeful that we can get to a good place and again, not miss this moment. So in terms of items that the Justice Act includes that the House bill does not, that would be, you know, false police reports on crime, sex, uh, police sex acts, um, creating that as a new crime, two new commissions. Um, in terms of the House bill, which I think, you know, was already really well covered by Keenan, of course, you have 242, qualified immunities, um, pattern or practice independent reviews for use of force investigations, restrictions on transfer of military equipment. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're very much so aware of, you know, where we're a little bit far apart. Um, and we also know that one bill cannot and will not solve every issue in the criminal justice system. But again, you know, we have a moment here to take action to put our country on a path towards progress. This is a defining moment for so many reasons. And we know that this body has come together before to accomplish major change. We did it in the First Step Act not long ago, and again, under this president. So again, Senator Scott is gonna continue working to see that we can get something pivotal done here. Um, he has really great relationships, frankly, across the aisle and within the Republican conference as well. You know, I don't think that anybody, um, and, I, and I'll speak for the Senate side, um, but you know, I think members have been very vocal about not questioning each other's intentions and each other's heart in this process. And that's so important um, because again, we're gonna have to come together as one body if we really want to achieve something here. And the reality is, is that we do. We know that we're heading into the 4th of July recess in what, two or three days? I apologize, I keep forgetting whether today is Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, so I think it would be very, very surprising if we saw something move this week. Um, but we have another real shot, you know, before August recess as well. And so Senator Scott's definitely committed to continuing the conversation and seeing how far we can go. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over because I've been ranting for quite a while. No, uh, Emily, that was really excellent. And, you know, it's always worth kind of reiterating on our end, you know, the real emphasis that NCSL puts on bipartisanship um, and kind of that, that cooperation. So really uh, appreciate you outlining the key elements that are the same in the two bills. And, and thank you to Keenan as well. I mean, I know you provided that side by side about, you know, the different, you know, key developments from the Senate, House, and the White House, and, and outlining, you know, the, the, the similarities there too. So awesome. Uh, we really appreciate that. Um, and I think I'm actually going to turn it now to uh, Susan Frederick, um, who's, you know, as I mentioned with NCSL's criminal justice program in DC, uh, for questions uh, from the chat box. Hi there. So one question that's come up is, you both have alluded to areas of similarities within the two pieces of legislation, but in the sense of, of what's it looking like in terms of moving it through both chambers and getting it signed into law. Pull out your crystal balls and give us your best guess or your best estimate on, you know, what it looks like in terms of forward movement and where we are and how we can be helpful. Well, from the perspective of the House side, you know, we've done our job. We passed a bill uh, that was a bipartisan bill uh, and it's now over in the hands of the Senate. Uh, Senate Republicans and Senate Democrats have to, uh, I think, decide whether they want to start with uh, a base bill that actually has you know, bipartisan support and has gone through one chamber already, or uh, if they want to essentially start from scratch. And I think that you know, that's what's being debated actively at this point. Emily, did you want to comment on that as well, on where the Senate stands with moving the, the Senate bill? Yeah, for sure. Um, and again, you know, I will note that three Democratic senators voted in favor of the motion to proceed on our side um, to move to the Justice Act, which is fantastic. You know, we're really thrilled to have bipartisan support for our bill as well here in the Senate. Of course, we didn't have the same threshold that we needed to actually move to debate um, as that was obstructed um, by the reality that we did not get enough Democrats on board 
um, to begin the amendment process, which again, Senator Scott welcomed. And so, you know, it is fantastic that we initially have a couple members willing to cross party lines um, to really seize the moment and get something done. And so I think our hope is that we can work out the differences and, and hopefully move to a package much like the First Step Act, um, where again, we see overwhelming numbers that, you know, really, really rise to the moment and again, move something quickly to again, put this country back on a path towards progress. Can I ask a follow up? Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I actually was wondering, so, you know, do, do you think, you know, with this window coming back after the July 4th recess, whether there will be like competing priorities, specifically with coronavirus relief um, on the table or on people's minds, um, and whether that would be kind of a competing priority um, for uh, both senators and congressmen um, in, in looking at this particular uh, bill, whether that's a new bill or amending existing bills. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I won't speak for the House side, obviously, um, Keenan, Keenan can definitely do that. Um, Leader McConnell was pretty vocal about planning to turn towards a phase four proposal in mid to late July. Um, again, last time, that was a really quick process, right? In terms of moving phases one and two, um, and even phase three to a large extent, those are very quick processes um, where we were able to come together in a bipartisan fashion, again, very quickly to get that bill done. And so I'm hopeful that phase four is similar in that it is, you know, quick and collaborative action that is deliberate and delivers impactful relief. And so again, I think the reality is, is that if this chamber continues to make policing reform a priority, um, and Senator Scott certainly hopes that it does, um, and if we can reach a consensus with the Democrats, you know, there's no reason that, you know, it should take that much time to actually move it within the floor space. Um, but again, that all depends what sort of agreements can actually be reached. Senator McAllister, I see that you uh, had a question for the for our speakers. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. The question I had was, how many Republicans voted for the House bill? Three Republicans voted for the House bill. Um, three Republicans also voted against the motion to recommit, which was Senator Scott's bill. Okay, thank you. So I have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Lucia, go ahead. Sorry, Susan. I, Keenan, did you want to uh, offer insights on uh, coronavirus as a relief package as a potential, I don't know, so, uh, yeah. so source I, of attention? Right. Yeah. So I think here, um, you, know, you know, Senate leadership, the, the speaker has made her priorities plain in terms of providing, you know, continuing, uh, you know, relief as we're dealing with a dynamic uh, situation. I think part of what's going on right now is that we have to figure out what's actually coming out of the White House um, and react to the de-emphasis of um, state funding uh, and to see if we can you know, come up with, I think, uh, a message that will you know, balance the needs of you know, where we've established our priorities in the House and you know, get the president to you know refocus on um, where the country is at this moment. Um, we've actually shown that we have been able to you know pivot pretty quickly, um, you know, based upon these necessities. And as I said before, uh, we pivoted quickly and did send a bipartisan bill over to the other chamber. Now I have a question coming in here on um, the penalties in in the bills. And we, we know that the burn JAG funding is, is under fire, if you will, uh, for the penalty provisions of the bill. A couple of things um, to ask you about that. First of all, is there any discussion at all um, about having the locals be responsible for their own noncompliance as opposed to shouldering the states with that responsibility for all local noncompliance? Um, in a jurisdiction that's large, for example, uh, or a state, a large state, it will be difficult for the state to keep track of every small law enforcement agency, um, especially if they don't have a streamlined or uniform system and they're all kind of disparate and, and separate. So have you all talked about that at all as something that might um, be revised if this bill ever does, you know, if it makes it through and is going to conference? 
So when you're actually looking at the Burn JAG program, you're looking at whether you're talking about the formula grants or whether you're talking about the program grants. And um, depending upon which section you're actually talking about, um, there's different you know, conditionality that's placed on it. Um, you know, where what we're trying to do is where the state has the responsibility for the formula grants, they need to actually have a system of monitoring what's actually going on down in their localities where they're actually you know, sending money. Um, around the discretionary grants, the programmatic grants, that's a little bit easier. That actually falls back on the Department of Justice to then monitor um, who's actually getting that money and whether they're, they're in, in compliance. The, the real truth of the matter about you know, both of these bills is that um, the federal government is using indirect mechanisms to actually incentivize or disincentivize uh, behavior. And so it, you know, whether the, the degree or the extent to which that uh, is successful is something that will require a great deal of diligence by the executive branch after you know, the, the, the passage of, of some federal legislation. Thanks for that. Um, one more question I have here, uh, and e Emily, you alluded to it a little bit, and, and Keenan, you did as well. Can you just give us a brief description of what the major differences between the two pieces of legislation, the House bill and the Senate bill are, and if there's any discussion of compromise on any of those particular provisions at this time? Yeah, absolutely. So again, you know, there's a lot of areas of overlap, but even the areas of overlap, there are some key differences. Um, so while both bills do address chokeholds, for instance, the House bill goes farther and also addresses carotid restraints. Um, Senator Scott actually told um, Senate Democrats that, you know, absolutely great, go ahead and offer an amendment and I'll support it. Um, and so those are some obvious areas where, you know, Senator Scott's more than willing to have a conversation, not just have a conversation, but to agree on perfecting the bill and improving it, um, you know, beyond as it's currently written. Um, of course, beyond that, you know, even with body cameras, we include a litany of penalties for officers that turn off body worn cameras. Um, but again, you know, the House bill, of course, touches on 242 qualified immunity pattern of practice, um, you know, independent reviews for use of force investigations, restrictions of military equipment. Um, and of course, I won't pretend to speak for Keenan. And then of course, you know, our bill includes the two new commissions, includes um, a new crime for officers engaging in sex acts, as well as false police reports for penalty enhancements. Um, so again, you know, there's a lot of differences between the penalties as, as you've also noticed. Um, in a couple different places. And again, you know, even if you're looking at, for example, no-knock warrants, right? Um, the House bill, of course, bans no-knock warrants for drug cases at the federal level and creates an incentive for states to do so. Um, the Justice Act studies them before taking significant action to change longstanding policies. Um, and again, you know, creating an outright ban at the state level with respect to policing reforms is very difficult to do. Um, again, there are a number of constitutional limitations there. And so both bills take that into account by primarily incentivizing these changes through financial forces, right? Through the federal purse strings that we have available to incentivize the change that we wanna see. Um, so that's a reality that we, I think we all have to grapple with through this process. Um, but again, you know, speaks to, again, a lot of the overlap um, and hopefully the other provisions I noted sufficiently cover the differences. So um, we're so the 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 reality of the two bills is that um, Senator Scott's bill does nothing to address specific back end remedies. Okay, the bill does not address uh, potential criminal liability, uh, you know, for use of excessive force through you know Section two four two. Um, it doesn't do anything with, um, you know, racial profiling. Uh, it does not uh, address um, qualified immunity, which uh, even Justice Clarence Thomas expressed uh, skepticism about. Um, it does nothing with um, independent investigations of complaints around excessive force. So, I mean, there are no back-end uh, provisions 
um, you know, in the bill whatsoever. Um, that has been something that has been discussed by um, LCCHR and is one of the primary reasons why they characterize um, the Scott Bill as being um, a sort of reform light provision. Um, I'm glad to see that uh, he has, you know, come to uh, uh, our position with respect to carotid holds. Um, but um, again, um, we, you know, in the you know, George Floyd um, Act, address this with great um, specific, you know, with great specificity. Um, we also um, have added the you know, law enforcement uh, loophole bill uh, to uh, the George Floyd Act. Um, that was actually a House bill at its inception. Um, we've already passed the uh, lynching out of the House, and the reason that that bill has not gotten to the Senate is it's being blocked by Senator uh, Paul. Um, so I hope that Senator Scott will prevail upon uh, his esteemed colleague and unblock that bill so that it can go to the president's desk. Um, you know, with respect to the commission, uh, the you know, Boys and Men Commission um, and the Criminal Justice uh, Reform Commission, uh, we think those two are very fine proposals, but they're outside the scope of, uh, you know, policing reform and, you know, the House is prepared to move those uh, independently. Um, what we're trying to do with this bill is stay focused on the issue of policing reform uh, and uh, to take some very specific direct programmatic steps. Um, I know that um, you know, Senator Scott's bill uh, is devoted to um, a variety of best practices specifically, um, but it also um, fails to you know, take even the, the step of the president's executive order, which is to uh, put in place national standards and have them um, implemented through accreditation and condition uh, the receipt of you know DOJ uh, you know grant program funds on uh, beginning and achieving and maintaining accreditation of departments. Um, we think that you know, temp you know Senator Scott's bill is uh, a good um, effort, and uh, you know uh, chair of the CBC Bass. Uh, is you know engaging and continuing discussions with them, possibly even today about how we would move forward. But you know the fact of the matter is is that um, it uh, does not address one uh, major specific element of individual policing accountability on the back end. And in this moment, we we think that that's a critical failing of the bill. Um, and you know we hope that. Uh, we can work with him and come to terms uh, on that and that he can, you know, embrace some of these provisions going forward. Thank you both. I'm going to go ahead and turn this back over to Lucia to, I don't see any more questions here. I didn't receive any more. So um, last chance for anyone to ask a question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Susan. Um, and yeah, thank you just again, uh, Keenan and Emily for that really excellent, uh, in-depth and candid overview. Um, I think it really is helpful to our members and to us, uh, to hear your perspective on these, um, really critical issues. Um, so, uh, as we're approaching the hour here, I will just, you know, as a reminder, uh, note that you know our next policing uh, briefing and our last will be on uh, July 15th uh, at three o'clock Eastern and we will discuss recent state legislative action uh, in this area in policing reform as well um, and so folks uh, should should tune into that. Uh, thank you again to to everybody on the line and to our speakers um, and have a have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks so much for having me. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. All right.